Northern Ireland. Francis Hughes, member of the outlawed Irish Republican Army, dies after starving himself in a Belfast jail. His death by fasting follows that of Bobby Sands, another IRA inmate and newly elected member of the British Parliament. The night Sands died, scores of hit-and-run battles erupted in the streets of Belfast. Battles between Catholic youths and British security forces. Five people were seriously injured. A bank and a church destroyed. Several factories damaged by fire. I'm going to raise it. Here, use a bottom of it. Use a bottom of it. Hold on, I got it. Bottom. Yeah. Good night. Dozens of cars, trucks, and buses were hijacked, turned into blazing barricades. The British government had refused to meet Sands' demands that he and other Irish Republican inmates be treated as special category prisoners, distinct from common criminals. Worldwide reaction, especially from Catholics, was generally hostile to Britain. In New York, some of the U.S.'s 13 million Irish Americans made their feelings known. But the British argue that allowing IRA inmates to wear their own clothes, to be excused work, and to associate freely with other inmates would mean treating them as political prisoners. And that would lend legitimacy to the IRA's violent campaign to reunite Northern Ireland with the Irish Republic to the south. The British feared they'd set a precedent of surrender to the IRA. They also feared any concessions would provoke a violent backlash from the Protestant extremists. Sand's death had long been expected. His hunger strike was an index of the depth of feeling among the province's Catholic population. For the struggle of the IRA prisoners in Belfast May's prison has become a symbol of anger for many of Northern Ireland's half million Catholics, a minority alongside a million Protestants in the province. Even before Sand's death, there was the worst street violence for years in Londonderry. Sands' supporters could claim he'd been vindicated through due democratic process. During his hunger strike, he was elected Member of Parliament in a by-election at Fermanagh, near the border with the Irish Republic. Sands' supporters said then that electing their man would save his life. They were sure the British government would never let a legally elected MP starve to death. <laughs> Sand's mother was asked if she'd let her son be force fed. Be intravenously fed? No, he told me not to. It's a sad thing to say, and I would feel I love my son just like any other mother does. But uh, I wouldn't. I can't. He asked me not to, and I've promised him not to. At Sand's funeral, 50,000 Catholics watched the solemn rites of Irish republicanism. Now that the British have let Bobby Sands die, and Francis Hughes also, they feel they can contain IRA reaction. Tighter security with the Irish Republic has helped them stifle the IRA militarily. But they may also fear they've reinforced Catholic solidarity with the terrorists. For Ireland has a tradition of political martyrs. Fourteen Irish prisoners have now died by fasting this century. Two IRA inmates joined Sands and Hughes on hunger strike. They, too, seem determined to die. The issue of prisoners' status has become inextricably linked with the overall pattern of conflict during the past 12 years of troubles. Bobby Sands embodied that conflict. He was just 14 in 1968 when the latest troubles began. Catholics here were protesting at poor housing, job discrimination, and lack of representation in the province's government. But the following year, it became apparent that the Catholic dream of a reunited Irish Republic was taking hold of the civil rights movement. 
Protestants in Londonderry clashed with rival Catholic groups. Police tried to disperse them. Soon after, the first British troops arrived in the province. The pattern was cast for years to come. Bobby Sands was later to recall how his family had to move house due to anti-Catholic feeling in their neighborhood. Two years later, the British government introduced internment, prison detention without trial. The Catholic population bitterly opposed this. IRA recruitment rose. IRA hunger strikers in Belfast were demanding political prisoner status. On their behalf, a group of Belfast Republicans handed in a petition to the British Prime Minister. The inmates won. In a critical security situation, the British conceded political status for IRA prisoners. British Northern Ireland Secretary at the time was William Whitelaw, seen here on a visit to Londonderry. To many, the decision seemed a gesture of appeasement, a continuing effort to isolate IRA hardliners from the Catholic population. When Bobby Sands was arrested in 1973, guilty of armed robbery, he served his time as a political prisoner. He was just 19 years old. In the same conciliatory spirit, the British phased out internment. They began releasing internees from Long Kesh in gestures of goodwill. But an IRA bombing campaign in England was to harden British attitudes. In 1976, they withdrew political status for newly convicted IRA prisoners, although inmates already jailed would continue to benefit from the special category. Jailed IRA man Frank Stagg was allowed to die in an English prison after his hunger strike demanding political status there. The British refused to force feed Stagg. In that year also, Bobby Sands was freed. He returned to jail a few months later on firearms charges. Only this time, he was to have no political prisoner status. As the British cut back IRA terrorism, they gradually withdrew half their troops to just 11,000 men. And so the focus of conflict changed to the propaganda level. The Mays prison became a key battleground as the IRA inmates fought for special category status. Two years ago, many of them began smearing their cells with their own excrement in the infamous dirty protest. They dressed in blankets, refusing to wear prison uniforms. Last fall, several of the prisoners went on hunger strike. International pressure grew on the British government, pressure for a more humanitarian flexibility on the issue of prisoners' status. So in December, the British government gave what it now claims were only general assurances to the strikers that conditions were improving. The fast ended. But the IRA say the British promised real concessions on issues of prison work and clothing, then went back on those promises. That's why Bobby Sands launched his fatal hunger strike on March the 1st. The Republicans say IRA inmates deserve special treatment because most are convicted in special anti-terrorist courts without a jury. The British say non-jury courts are necessary only because witnesses are intimidated by IRA terror. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher has refused to yield on the status of political prisoners, as on the status of Northern Ireland itself. In Northern Ireland, we, by law, have guaranteed the people of Northern Ireland that the status of Northern Ireland shall never be changed unless the people of Northern Ireland want it to be changed. And, of course, any change could go through the United Kingdom Parliament. That's enshrined in law. Nothing can alter that. The other aspect is that, nevertheless, we really must try to live in peace and reconciliation with our neighbors south of the border, which is the Republic of Ireland. It's the only country with whom we have a land border with both members of the community. We have to cooperate across the border. Uh, we want to get as much economic cooperation as possible. Those things remain the same. The Sands and Hughes deaths may temporarily halt the rapprochement between Britain and the Irish Republic. That growing accord was evidenced in Dublin last December when Thatcher met Irish Premier Hawkey. 
Most Irish politicians say the Northern Ireland problem calls for an all-Ireland solution. But the Republic's an increasingly prosperous member of the European community, and many there reject the IRA's blend of socialism and nationalism, along with its violence. These Northern Ireland Protestants fear British accord with Dublin implies movement toward a united Ireland. Any concession made to the Catholics would have to face a probable Protestant backlash from paramilitary groups like the Ulster Defence Association. Its feared militant unionist Ian Paisley could take command of the province's Protestant community. He also bitterly opposes the growing entente between London and Dublin. Despite British reassurances, he suspects a deal behind the Protestants' back, a deal which could lead toward the eventual reunification of Ireland, where the Protestants would be a minority. Dublin control or involvement in the affairs of Northern Ireland would be disastrous to the material well-being of Ulster. Subversive of our civil and religious freedom, destructive of our citizenship, and perilous to the position of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom. A recent incident well illustrated these continuing deep divisions between Northern Ireland's Protestants and Catholics. Ian Paisley attends an Easter memorial service at a tiny village near Londonderry a service for loyalists killed during the Troubles. Paisley lays a wreath where one of the Protestants died. We will remember them. We will remember them. A mile or two away, Catholics march to the village on behalf of the hunger strikers. Hundreds of police block the march. Catholic activists argued with them. This is a bit of Ireland, and I demand on behalf of the Irish people the right to walk our roads without being molested or without interference. The marchers were told to stay where they were and stay calm. But stone throwing was soon to start, with the police the target an incident which encapsulates how the British see their role in Northern Ireland. Using local police and British troops were necessary to prevent armed confrontation between militant Catholics and Protestants. As here, the security forces often get caught in the middle. The British also point to the security justification for their presence, the continuing terrorism in Northern Ireland. Here, IRA gunmen murdered a Protestant official and his son, shot dead at their home, which the gunmen also firebombed. Critics of the troops' presence say this violence denotes the army's failure, not a reason for it to stay. In 12 years, over 2,000 people have been killed here, at least 22,000 injured. Many Irish Catholics see the British Army as an army of occupation, maintaining Protestant dominance in what they see as their homeland. The Republicans claim their Belfast Easter rally this year was one of their biggest ever. That's mainly due to revitalized support for the Republican prisoners demanding special category status. For after Sands and Hughes' deaths, IRA prestige is high. It could well recruit a whole new generation of youngsters. Worldwide sympathy, especially in the U.S., could mean more funds to buy arms. And it's likely a stronger IRA will provoke a violent Protestant reaction. A more powerful IRA, a Protestant paramilitary backlash. The very results the British wanted to avoid by rejecting the IRA's inmates' demands could well come about by letting them die. This is the British government's dilemma. The Protestants won't move from their part of the United Kingdom, from these six counties where they're the majority. The British, despite reassuring the Protestants, may well see an all-Ireland solution as the best approach, however oblique. The Protestants will resist that with force. 
Meanwhile, the deaths of Sands and Hughes have already raised again the level of violence in Northern Ireland. The patterns of conflict here may change. For now, more hunger strikers could die. No solution, no peace is anywhere at hand.